Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. The well, Warbird tube, we are sort of in a uh, different situation than we thought we were going to be. Uh, we should be looking at the runway and uh, all the airplanes here at uh, Air Venture Oshkosh, but instead we're looking at this lovely 1991 vintage paneling inside the uh, communication center. Uh, uh, brief, a brief rain shower was uh, marching up on us just as we were about to go on the air, so we moved inside. We'll try to move outside in a little bit. So welcome everybody who's watching on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, and if you are on either uh, Facebook or YouTube, just hit that like or uh, follow button and uh, also subscribe on YouTube so you know when we go live uh, for Werber Tube and all the other CAF uh, videos that uh, you'll be able to see. Now, as you're watching the presentation, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat box and Leah will uh, send those off to us and uh, we'll try to answer them within the within the broadcast if we can. And uh, so we would like to welcome you officially to Warbird Tube episode number 79, live from the flight line at uh, EAA Air Venture Oshkosh 2022. And uh, joining me right now is uh, CAF President Hank Coates. Hi, Hank. Hey, Steve. How you doing, man? <laughs> doing good. It's Oshkosh, man. It's going to rain. Oh, well, it's yeah. not going to rain. Yeah, it's going to rain. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the, uh, the CAF presence here uh, during the show. So uh, this year we have uh, about 19 airplanes that are in and out. Uh, you know, obviously Fifi and, and Diamond Little B29, B24. We have a pair of B25s. We've got a P40, P51, a couple of those. I mean, just kind of boring stuff, really. Uh, we got an SBD, a couple of BTs, uh, a couple of C45s, P39, the new Aero Cobra. Yes. Uh, you know, the P, the P, uh, with, with Bud Anderson's yep. paint scheme, which was unveiled yesterday. That was a great success. Uh, some PTs, a couple of T6s, and, and, they, and even some member members brought their own personal aircraft. So we have uh, at least, I, I, I would conservatively guess, uh, four or 500 members here this this, this weekend. This Excellent. Week. Yeah. Excellent. Well, overall, uh, what's the state of the membership at CAF? It's going uh, really, really well. We've had a couple of initiatives. Uh, you know, there's several different kinds of levels of members in the, in the CAF from uh, the Writers Club that we've established, uh, supporting members and, gen and uh Colonels, uh, you know, we're up uh, 21,000 members, but if you look at it from a, a, a big picture and the volunteers and the supporters, there's hundreds of thousands worldwide. We have, you know, we have 80 units right now, actually, I think 82 in the U.S. We have a unit in uh, Belgium, Switzerland, uh, the U.K. and France, and we have kind of a, a, a unit that still sort of exists in New Zealand. Um, and we've started a new unit initiative. Uh, we've had quite a few units that we've established this year and last based upon a new paradigm for the CAF. Um, we go into an area which we identify as having the demographics and maybe not a unit close by and we geocache it. We go in there and we look for members and then we say, listen, here's the deal. You get 35 members, you know, five aircraft sponsors and you put the unit together and you know you do it within a certain time frame and we'll get you an airplane and that's been hugely uh successful we had a 17 year old young man in connecticut that formed a unit from beginning to end he's got like 40 something members i mean knocking it out of the park and so it's been it's been wildly successful yes uh, we talked to the uh, guys from the rainier squadron uh last week uh with their uh, 1819 and they were really uh, supportive of the new unit initiative. Now, yep. they, they formed a little bit before that, but they've been able to take advantage of some of the resources that you had for them. They've already got an airplane that's up and flying. And uh, they're uh, already doing rides. They're going to air shows. Yep. It's it's really been great. It You know, it, it, it was, uh, we started this out, and, and this is just the, the thought process behind it. And this is more for CSP membership, but it's, it's an intriguing. We this started three and a half, four years ago, three years ago when we, we stood, you know, we don't have units in these areas. And we think that based upon the population, you know, Pensacola, you would think that there'd be a unit there and there never was. And so we started focusing on areas and that's where the Florabama unit came from was that new unit initiative. And then 
um, Gerald Oliver had a great idea. He said, we have all this marketing data from all the airplanes that are around going to air shows and, and doing rides and touring. We can take the marketing data and the demographics and combine them, and it makes for almost a sure thing. And uh, with his help and, and support, it's been wildly successful. And, and we have people lining up to try to do this. I mean, we don't have enough money to buy all the airplanes for all the units. It's a good problem to have. It is. It yeah. is. So, and now the headquarters fully established at uh, Dallas Executive Airport. Yes, sir. Uh, sort of on the south side of, of town. And the uh, brand new education center is up and running. And that is gorgeous. It, it really is. Um, so, the first year, you know, we, it's fully paid for. Uh, there's no debt on that thing. The, we, we raised money from um, corporate sponsors, from foundations. Uh, the Ray Foundation was was very, very, very important in achieving that objective. Local foundations, national level foundations, uh, corporate corporate uh, entities in the local area, people in the local area, and members all put in, you know, put in there to build that thing, and we paid it. We paid it in full. It is complete. Um, you know, that's now Fifi and Diamond Lil's home and several other aircraft, the T-34, uh, Bucket of Bolts, um, and, and an L, the Education L-9 that we, that we fly the kids in. So it is fully functional. It's up and running. And then we have uh, an incredible hands-on lab and then several other buildings. We have the, the, um, the, the nose art is, is an on exhibition there. It looks awesome. You know, you were a big part of helping us get that done. And, um, we have a, some amount of foot track, but we have a lot of uh, traffic, but we have a lot of things going on with kids. We have right. uh, the, a J3 Cub that's being rebuilt by some kids uh, through a, a benefactor in the local school that are working with us. We're working with industry. So there's a lot of fun things going on. There's a lot of fun to be around. Yeah. And, of course, the big uh, Wings Over Dallas Air Show coming up uh, over the Veterans Day weekend. Yep. Uh, so we we have never tried to do it quite that late in the year. Um but the city has asked us to try to do it uh, because they want to partner with us. And we think it's a great weekend to do it. Right. It's going to be, you know, it's the CAF homecoming. And um, so all the birds, man, they head out in March and April and they start spreading around the world and then they come home. And uh, we have had units from California come and, and, and then go back home. But it really is uh, the CAF show. It's an opportunity for everybody to come in do some rides we can we can be because we own the airport basically for those three days by virtue of the city and uh we can do rides we can have tours and if somebody wants to be if a unit wants to be creative and do something to help make money for their unit then then we help support them to make that money so that they can can do things for the next year right and an important uh, point that you've made there with the uh, with the units uh they're all volunteers that's right? correct and they are assigned an aircraft and they have to raise the funds to maintain the airplane and fly it. And, and uh, some of them are very creative in, in how they do it. Of course, uh, I, I always look to uh, Beth Jenkins in the uh, B-25 for uh, uh, all of her T-shirt sales, which has uh, helped to uh, keep that airplane flying for many, many years. Uh, but uh, yes, as you as you mentioned, there's ride programs and PXs and everything like that. And uh, the headquarters is really at Wings Over Dallas, is really supportive of the individual units getting out, being able to, you know, regenerate their coffers. Well, the, the membership and the volunteers is really, really where the, where, the, where the rubber meets the road with the CF. They're the most important part, uh, you know, and so our job is to em empower that and to go out and do the national press releases and coordinate the insurance. Our job is to break down the barriers so they can get out and do their thing. And every unit is different. Some units focus on golf tournaments. You know, Syntex has probably one of the best golf tournaments out there. They do formal dances. We had an incredible dance at Dallas here a couple of months ago. Uh, and we have another one coming up next year. And if you look on our website, you can see that. I think the Tommy Dorsey band is going to play. And you'll have Fifi in one corner and Diamond Lil in the other with the lighting. It's just it's an amazing event. But every unit has their own thing, whether it's and it may be a combination of things. It may be doing rides. It may be a formal event every year. It may be an air show. Uh, they may partner like, uh, for example, SoCal partners with the AAA to put on a big air show in Camarillo. And it funds both of those entities down there. And it's wildly successful. So it's all volunteer, though. Very, very important. And uh, what are some of the other things that uh, you'd like to highlight with, uh, with CAF, either here or uh, around the country, around the world? So we have 180 airplanes now. And it's slowly going up. It may go down by one, but then it goes up by two. Yep. Uh, and that's, that's really, really cool. 
you know, what's important for us is coming to Oshkosh because with a with 80 80 something units because you know they'll they'll sign a charter back home and I won't know about it. I say 82. That <laughs> yeah. I think that's what it is. Um, it's so important because with 82 units, we the 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 national level guys that are out there trying to empower the units and and do the things so that they can do their things and give them new members and and do all those those efforts. Um, we can't go to every unit all the time. We 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 kind of play whack a mole. We we try to go to the, and do the fun things, but sometimes we go and have to help them. Right. And coming here, we have the ability. I have talked to members so far this week from Alaska, California, uh, you know, Connecticut, and so and and the UK. So by coming here, we're able to reach all the members, and so it's really really important for us to come here and be a part be a team member with EAA and, and support EAA and try to be value added for the show. Exactly. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, UK unit. They are also, uh, they're very involved in uh, trying to get a, an airfield there restored. Yes. That, that, they, they do all sorts of yeah. great things. And, and they're a relatively new unit. They just stood up uh, well, a couple of years ago. Interestingly, we had a unit that was actually, I think somehow the Royal family was involved. You yes. may, you may have more knowledge about that than Prince, I do. Prince Philip at the time. Yeah. And um, so there is a rich history of the CAF in the UK. For whatever reason, it kind of fell apart, and they reestablished it very, very quickly uh, right after we went to D-Day three years ago. And uh, by the way, D-Day three years ago was the 75th, so if you add two years to three years, then it's the 80th. So in, in 2024, the CAF and the D-Day squadron are going back going to back. Europe for the 80th. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. And, I mean, pulling the, off that many DC-3s, C-47s going across uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. So now you know how to do it, right? It'll be easy. It, I'm not going <laughs> to say it's going to be easy. I will say I will agree with you easier. Sure. And I'm, I can't really divulge anything because we're in the we're in the baby steps. But but word is that there may be more than than DCs going over. Oh, so right. we'll see how that pans out. So with uh, the aircraft that are here, the members that are here, uh, you know, as you said, uh, CAF is really helping to support the the events uh, and uh, look uh, forward to seeing some of our uh, CAF aircraft in the air shows. Any final thoughts before we wrap up tonight? Well, if, if anybody's here, you might want to go over to Kid Venture. Uh, oh, we, yes. we really love kids, and, and we do have the Red Tail trailer over there. Uh, so they're back again supporting uh, the new P-63s here. Airbase George is over there. They've got their their uh, their air, they, they have uh, their two. They got a P-51 and the uh, P-63 over there. So so they're well represented. Um, you know, it's just uh, it's it's one of those things. I do a lot of uh, posts and things, mostly on LinkedIn. But you know, I keep saying the word amazing, and because there isn't a better word to describe it. And uh, we just uh, we enjoy being here and being a part of the team. And uh, if there's something we can do to make it better, if there's any CF members or other people that have questions, you know, get them to me. And um, if I can't answer them, I, I will get you the guy that can or the gal that can. So excellent. Hank Coates, the uh, president of uh, CAF. Thanks for dropping in and uh, <laughs> in our, our makeshift it's, studio. It's sunny now. I know. It's sunny. <laughs> the broadcast didn't start and the sun came out. <laughs> like, well, it, you know, it's Oshkosh. The weather's always going to change. So we got that going for us. So anyway, we are going to talk with uh, Dick Napinski from EIA in uh, just a few moments. So stand by. back live from the uh, air show announcer stand uh, here at EIA Adventure Oshkosh 2022 as uh, Dick Dupinski from the uh, EIA uh, PR department uh, is, is joining me as, as you said the uh, you like our new mobile studio this is nice I mean <laughs> as long as you got somebody strong enough to move the table around this is all right you know it's fine. Well, uh, Dick, this has been a, uh, a whirlwind week already mm -hmm. uh, I understand aircraft movements and the number of aircraft that are here is way up it is. You know, uh, yesterday they had more than 2,200 aircraft movements. O'Hare had about 2,000. So we win again. 
And, uh, you know, that's it. World's busiest airport, according to the FAA. Uh, but it's, it is tremendous. I was just down at the end of the South 40. Those of you who may not be familiar may have seen it on the map. It's called Fond du Lac, I think. Yeah, it's, uh, much. Uh, but, no, it is tremendous. It's, uh, we have about 5,000 airplanes on the field when it's completely full. And this morning they were down to filling in holes, and that was it. So it was just a tremendous year so far, and it's great to see, you know, the weather kind of turning our way here and, um, you know, can move the mobile studio outside and have all kinds of fun. That is true. Uh, and, you know, so from the weekend on, uh, there's just been – air traffic coming in left and right, and it's been fun to watch. Uh, not everybody loves ADSB, but to be able to watch the live uh, yeah. aircraft coming in and just seeing how everything funnels through you know, a Fisk arrival and the Warbird arrival, and it, these things that you've heard about for all these years, and if you've never done it, you don't quite understand, but you get that visual picture just by looking at your computer, and then oh, you yeah. see the number of, <laughs> of aircraft oh, on, yeah. on the way in. When and, it's just a yellow line yes. with wings on it all the way down. Uh, you know, And some pilots are ambivalent about ADSB until right. they're coming into Oshkosh and somebody cuts in line and the air traffic controllers say, you get back. Oh, they you know? do. Oh yeah. Oh, if good. they find them and they're on ADSB, they go back of the line, back of the line. There you go. <laughs> no cutting in line. So, you know, and you can hear the collective yay out of everybody else sure. coming in at that time. So, you know, it is something to just see, you know, the technology from people when they, you know, they had the paper note them and kind right. of flew in here and, um, you hoped everybody else had the paper note them at the same time. Uh, and now you put it right in the iPad and you've got everything you need. But still, it comes down to the basics. Good piloting and good control work and good ground crew all equals all these airplanes here. So the uh, aircraft, uh, like you said, you're just filling in filling in the holes here and there. So North 40 is full? Uh, North 40 is pretty close to full. You know, today and tomorrow are always transition days. Right. Uh, a lot of the people who came in, for instance, with the mass arrivals last weekend, there's a few of them starting to bug out a little bit, but right. then now you've got the people coming in for the long weekend, right. so they're filling in those holes. And um, today and tomorrow are going to be like that. Right. And then uh, toward the end of the week when it becomes you know, more air show and all of those things that we know. But, boy, what a tremendous first three days so far. Yes. And, uh, of course, tomorrow morning, <laughs> watching the ADSB will be everybody going out. Yeah. A lot of folks, as you say, are going out. But, you know, it's that... It's that midweek turnover, mm -hmm. and it, that's kind of been the flow of the event for the last Forever. several years. You know, and, and you and I were on the staff long enough ago that, you know, we started, it was, you know, Friday through Thursday, yep. and then it went to Thursday through Wednesday, and then you know, Tuesday. And, so, and we always say, if you start this thing on Christmas, everybody's going to be here the 23rd, right. and everybody's going to leave the 30th before the last day. There's always going to be a last day, and that's right. one of the discussions that we've had through the years. Do you end it... After Saturday, you know, that's always something you can talk about, but right. there has to be a last day. If you finish up, you know, there are a lot of complications if you finish up after a night air show on right. Saturday because yeah. you've got people trying to get out in the dark, and that's not it safe is. either. Yeah. So it's, um, and I don't mean by aircraft, I mean exhibitors and other right. people at that point, campers. So, uh, you know, there are some times where a nice slow day to say your goodbyes and kind of wish everybody well and take your time in an airplane taking off. Yeah. yeah there's something to be said for that. Certainly is. Um we started out the week with uh, a little bit of uh, sad news, mm -hmm. uh, not completely unexpected, but uh, Tom Pobrezny, uh, EIA's president for many, many years, the convention chairman from the 70s yeah. on and, and until uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, he uh, passed away. And uh, his timing, as always, was just about perfect as he, uh, you know, uh, we got the news on, on Monday, opening morning, uh, but uh, and we've been relating Tom's stories, you know, uh, throughout the week so far and uh, really uh, all the vision that that he had to make this event what it is today and there are really some long long uh, visions and and foresight and planning that that's made this event uh, a world renowned event not only in aviation but in events in general yeah you think about this event first of all you know, Concord in 1985 the fourth American city where Concord has landed and you know, New York Washington DC Miami or Dallas one of the two and Oshkosh you know, just think about that in 1985, how incredible that was and what the crowds were like at that time when you saw Concord coming in. You know, that kind of elevation, the, the Italian military team the following year, you know, Voyager here a couple of years, really raised the event. And not just the airplanes, but the exhibitors, the what it could be. You start telling the big companies, you know, your customers are here with their airplanes and they're willing to buy things. That raises the level of the entire conversation, too. And that's just the event. Uh, when I think about Tom, I think about Young Eagles. 
celebrating 30 years yes. this year, almost 2.3 million kids flown. Uh, you think about the building, the magnificent building, the EA Aviation Center, which we just opened the new part uh, for the Education Center. Uh, that was his, basically, he talked Paul into it exactly. in many respects. Yes. You know, and, so, and then finally, uh, Sport Pilot, almost right. 20 years ago now that he shepherded that through over an entire decade saying we need better access uh, a certain level between ultralight and you know basic type certificated airplanes you know what goes there and what is that stepping stone so those four things that's a heck of a legacy without even talking about the fact that he was one of the nation's best air show pilots right. for 25 years with the Eagles. I mean, all of that. And, and that's one story I related a lot, that he'd be worried about garbage cans and traffic and porta potties and then jump in the airplane in the afternoon, fly 15 minutes with the Eagles, and then get back out and worry about traffic and porta potties and dumpsters. That was one of the uh, one of my, my memories that I shared with, with Jack uh, earlier this week, Jack Belton, the uh, CEO. Uh, and I said, I remember one of the early years I was on staff, this is before all the traffic, the vehicle traffic coming in, was it was a mess. Right. And uh, at the time, we only had one Bell 47 helicopter that, that didn't even do rides like they do now. Right. It was more for media and VIPs. But uh, traffic was backed up from Oshkosh to Fond du Lac. I mean, it was just the Highway 41 was a parking lot. And I remember Tom running up to Pioneer Airport, jumping in the in the 40, uh, Bell 47 with, the, with his pilot, they went out with and coordinated with the state patrol and the and the Winnebago County Sheriff's Office, and he got all the traffic moving again. Then came back down, and just like you said, jumped in Red Three, hauled uh, yeah. hauled himself down to the flight line, got inside his his airplane, his Eagle, strapped his helmet on, put on the uh, the belts, and away they went. Yeah. And I, I had I had seen him do that a number of times, but once he got in that airplane, everything else went away. And yeah. He just he would go do that routine with with Charlie and and uh, Gino. Yeah. And then come back out and like say, those garbage cans need to be emptied. And and you know it was one of those things. Yeah, you know, an engineer by education. Right. And and you and I both knew him very well for more than two decades. And that's the way he looked at things, very analytical. And we said, first of all, he took on such a legacy from his father, who was such a different personality. And then to make that adjustment and raise EAA to a new level that was unexpected and uncharted territory for the organization and do it very effectively and and have that and, and leave that as his legacy you know those are the kind of things that you have to remember and sometimes maybe because paul was such an outsized personality maybe tom didn't get his due quite enough but uh you know you, you try to remember that those two people as the family business grew it and created something that now we sit here and have tens of thousands of people waiting for a night air show here in oshkosh tonight i know it is amazing we talked about the night air show that's coming up uh, in probably about uh, about a half hour. Um, what are some of the other things, the big things that are happening this this week? Well, this week, of course, 75th anniversary of the Air Force. Uh, we've seen some of it today with some of the heritage flights. Uh, C-17 has come in here. Uh, all kinds of fun with that. Uh, you're going to see more airplanes come through. A lot of the generals are coming in to be a part of it. It is just um, a big celebration, and the Air Force is only doing a couple of civilian shows with their full support and air venture is one of them this year so we have that the airlines are here recruiting like mad i mean they need pilots all of you who've been on canceled flights can understand okay they need pilots um and they're here recruiting and that's why they're being bringing the big iron out they're bringing that out um so uh and that uh 15 years of women venture we mentioned 30 years of young eagles uh those type of things uh, 50 years of vans rvs you know, what an incredible accomplishment Eleven thousand plus of those airplanes flying around the world uh, yeah, those type of things are all part of the event this year. And people say, do you have a theme? Well, we have activities. You know, it's tough to have a theme overarching and things like that. But people come here for different reasons. So you create those activities, those those draws, so they can come here and enjoy themselves uh, with things that they love. I don't care if it's ultralights or warbirds or whatever it happens to be. So all of those things are, are part of what is Oshkosh. Uh, some of the uh, other things that have, that have happened through the years is a much uh, greater emphasis on pilot proficiency and pilot training, uh, and that's the new uh, addition to the museum, uh, or the Aviation Center. I guess it's not it, technically in the museum, right. but it's attached to it's it. Attached to it yeah. But uh, we're seeing that as, as really an extension of, of EIA saying, hey, we want to be in the forefront of making sure general aviation stays safe. It is, and you took a look at those Redbird simulators inside the Pilot Proficiency Center during Air Venture. Great attendance all week. And then we put them in a box and put them away and then drag them out the next year. Why? Why can't we use those? And so creating a vision like this, and a lot of our main donors 
stepped up and did that. You take a look, youth education, pilot proficiency, and then you put in a conference center to help fund the maintenance throughout the rest of the year, and you create a unique atmosphere here. It's when people have business meetings, everything from business meetings to conventions to weddings here, and we've had that through the years, you create a unique space. It's not a conference room. It's not a ballroom. It's you're in an atmosphere. And it's something memorable at that point. And, and that's part of what we created. And if you've been over to that place, uh, the new education center, you see it's an entirely different look than the rest of the museum. It's much more modern. It kind of makes uh, the museum's almost 40 years old now. And I was going to say. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, but, it's, but this is really stunning where it is and it fits so well and it's, it's a grand entryway and tomorrow night for the gathering that will be the entryway to the gathering instead of through the museum they'll be coming through the new education center awesome and with the 30th anniversary of uh, uh, young eagles also there's an education component uh, for young people in that new edition as well there is upstairs is really cool they've got stem labs hands-on stem labs classrooms that are modular type they can break down the walls and so forth yeah, a, a wind tunnel 3D printers. So you print up your airplane, take it over the wind tunnel. Does it fly? And you can watch it, see how that design, how do you tweak the design and so forth. And with online learning, we can go anywhere in the world with this now. And those are the kind of things. Emphasis on local. We're going to do a lot of local stuff. Very good. Uh, what are some of the things that you're looking forward to uh, this weekend? Uh, you know, this week, first of all, just meeting people. I and mean, you know that. You've been here enough times. That's just is seeing everybody once again and those heartfelt 30-second conversations that you have through the entire week and, and do those. But uh, just seeing some of the restorations this year coming in here. Everything from the Jenny from Northern Illinois coming up here, that reproduction, to the restored Messerschmitt ME 109. You're going, okay. People took their COVID break and they got to work. And, uh, you know, and so you see some of those things this year. And I think that helps explain the number of airplanes that we have here. You know, we're standing here tonight as you started your podcast and, and took a look at that beautiful, shiny aluminum aircraft past Grand Champion coming in and parking here. Right. And, of course, you can tell the people who haven't been here uh, sitting in their chairs or left their chairs here, which promptly ended up about 40 yards away. And so, you know, <laughs> exactly. yeah, beware of prop wash. Uh, so, you know, all of that is is something that, create these memories here and that's what this event is about and um yeah i'd like to say we have a new press center too you know so, uh, that is true <laughs> you know, so. i was i was amazed when i drove drove in for the first time seeing for those who don't know the uh, the original press center was a, a house that was located almost on the airport mm -hmm. uh, in the shadow of the old tower and uh, for many many years it uh, it reigned as press headquarters uh, it had its own quirks and uh, its own personality and it uh, lived a Good long life. <laughs> Full long, memorable life. Tens of but, thousands of media about the world that came through there. Been through those doors. Yeah. But uh, it got to the end of its uh, useful period, and last fall, it came one down. last yeah. You know, the traditional septic backup, I think, was getting a little weary on everybody because it was happening daily. Um, and then you have things you know, in this mold, age, um, you know, and all of that. So it was time. And when you have an event like this, you, you need a media workspace. So, you know, I've, I've dubbed it, you know, facetiously the Taj Mahal tent uh, but it's it's fun the the media like it a lot uh, you know don't have to run outside in a thunderstorm from the garage to the news conference tent anymore uh, it's all connected and so um, yeah it's, it's part of advancing things forward and, and this this event will always evolve it has right. to evolve because the people coming to it evolve and, and make other demands and so it's not the same as it was 40 years ago nor should it be and so that's a big part of it Yes, it looks, uh, it just drive you by looking at it, I haven't been in it yet, but uh, it looks like something you'd see at a PGA tour or some sort of uh, large uh, outdoor yeah. event uh, that really caters to the media. And that's that's really what you need. And that's where it came from. Uh, last uh, September, I had a chance to visit the Ryder Cup Media Center. Uh, I had a friend with the PGA tour, walked me through it. We took a whole bunch of photos, took the photos to Jack Pelton. He said, you're not getting that. And I went, okay. <laughs> and I said, they're just ideas, you know, and so... But we ended up with something very nice yes. because Arena and GES also did those tents. They knew exactly what I was talking about. So it's about one-third of the size of the Ryder Cup Media Center. But it, it is very functional. It does what we want. Like any first-year house, you start going things like, yeah, we've got to change the baseboards now. Right. You know, and things <laughs> like that. Uh, but, you know, those type of things. Um, but it's a great place for the media, and we're going to do that. And, and you see that throughout the entire ground. Some of the things that are 
evolving and becoming, like all oh, the four corners this year, how that's developed, um, the Learn to Fly Center, which is you know, expanded this year, you know, those type of things. So it's always going to evolve. I think one of the big ones is Boeing moving across the street to where Ford used to be, you know, and, and so Ford pulled back from a lot of their non-automotive sponsorships throughout the nation, Consumer Electronics Show, Us, Others, and because well, you got to sell cars, you got to have chips, and so um, so they ended up doing that. But Boeing took that spot. They've got a grand exhibit right over there. Yeah, that, that's one of the uh, the big questions that has, has, has gone around gone around the, the ground. What happened to Ford? Mm-hmm. And uh, thank you for addressing that. Well, I didn't even have to ask. Figured, figured it'd be asked. And so. <laughs> All right, well, any final thoughts for us, Dick, before we uh, wrap up? I, I tell you, we're three days in. Uh, it, it is great to see everybody. It's great to see our international visitors back for the first time in three years in mass the south africans are here you can hear a mountain camp shoulder and, <laughs> and the, the sling aircraft came in today as well they did Australia. yeah got delayed by weather a little bit but they got here and so uh they are here all the way from south africa and over the ocean too not the traditional way through europe and iceland and greenland but it's a long way so the world has come back to oshkosh and that's what makes it so cool excellent dick dipinski with uh, with eia joining us here on uh, warbird tube dick uh, I, I know you're a busy guy so I'll, I'll let you get to uh, you know whatever it is you need to get whatever to, it like, is i uh, do but this is relaxing i can stay up here for weeks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're more than welcome to okay. we, have, we have chairs i'll just lay down on the floor that's fine. Right. Thanks. <laughs> thanks again uh, dick and we'll be back in uh, just a moment with more caf warbird tube Live from the uh, air show announcer stand at EIA Air Venture Oshkosh 2022, we are having a we're having a grand time. And uh, yeah, Dick Napinski was just here, and he mentioned international visitors being back. And uh, one of our international visitors, a a, a former a victim of of Warbird Tube, uh, is Stephen Bridgewater. Uh, you were on on our uh, program Monday. You know? Yes, but uh, in, on one of our webinars, I forget, oh. we talked about air shows. We talked about air shows. <laughs> we talked about my travels around the world. Yes. Yep. And you haven't stopped traveling either. No, no, oh. no. It's been a busy couple of weeks. Tell us a little. Well, first of all, tell us a, your official title and, and what you do for a living. A living. I have a hobby I get paid for, really, don't <laughs> I? I'm the deputy editor for Aerospace Magazine, which is the magazine for the Royal Aeronautical Society based in London. We've got 22,500 professional aviator members. So they are pilots, designers, aeronautical designers, software engineers, anybody that works within the aviation profession. And they're a small group of us that produce a mag- monthly magazine. Um, so I joined the team about three months ago, having spent 22 years writing about general aviation aircraft and warbirds. And I'm now immersing myself in the world of military aviation and commercial aviation and anything that's cutting edge and uh, really sort of out there so we I mean, for example we've had an article recently on solar farms in space actually oh, um, okay. having solar panels on satellites and beaming the power down to earth so that's the sort of stuff that we're reporting on at the moment that's excellent now uh, in in our conversations uh between the webinar and, and, and you getting here you were almost here last year it was so very very close i was so very close <laughs> as a journalist although it was wasn't possible to travel into the u.s there was an exemption in place for journalists to come in right so I'd got my tickets booked, I got the hotel booked, and then the rules changed and I needed what was called a national interest exemption certificate. So AOPA, 
um, were kind enough to write that exemption so that uh, I really needed to be at, at AirVenture last year, sent all the paperwork off to the US Embassy, and they gave me permission to come to AirVenture. Excellent. On the Tuesday after AirVenture had started. So um, I didn't make it last year. But uh, So my last trip here was 2019. Yes. Uh, this is uh, my 10th visit. I first came in 2003, okay. which was the centenary flight. So what a year to uh, to have your first indoctrination into the world of Oshkosh and AirVenture, something I'd wanted to do since I was a kid. So, One of the things that, that you shared with me was a, a documentary that really inspired you uh, and, and sort of a Young Eagle-esque sort of thing that they just got, got the spark going. Yeah, very much. Um, the BBC ran a documentary series in the early 80s called Reaching for the Skies. And there was an episode on big aeroplanes and an episode on furthest travels so Lindbergh and, and Alcock and Brown and people like that. And they had an episode called The Joy of Flight. And it was filmed here at Oshkosh. And I must have been about seven or eight years old. And I can still remember sitting on the carpet in front of my uh, the, the TV in my parents' house and thinking, one day I'm going to go to this mythical place called Oshkosh. And I did. Yeah, and, and, and so this is my 10th tenth, tenth pilgrimage, as I say, to, uh, to AirVenture. And it, it never grows old. It's just you can't comprehend, unless you've been, just how special this place is. Yeah. It's a bit, I, I liken it to going to a music festival that has aeroplanes. You know, it, it's like the Woodstock of, of, of aeronautics. There you go. And I think like, that sums it up because it's the, and I think this year, because a lot of people haven't been for the last two years because of pandemics and different reasons, yeah. everybody seems so happy to be here. It's just got a real, I was just saying to Dick Lipinski, there's a vibe out there that people are just happy to be back, back in Wisconsin and, yeah, and the sun's out now, so. <laughs> yeah, it, it rained three drops and that yeah. was just, <laughs> just enough for us to move in and move out. Uh, but uh, aside from being here, you have been a traveler the last few weeks, haven't you now? I have. I've not been home for a few weeks now. Um, so I started off with the Royal International Air Two at um, the American Air Force Base at Royal Air Force Fairford in Gloucestershire in England, uh, which is the world's biggest military air show. So about 250 military aircraft there. So everything from... Oh, gosh, what do we have? There was a U-2 on static. Of course, we had a U-2 flying today. I mean, I can't believe two weeks ago I was excited about seeing a U-2 in the static park, and here we are seeing one in, in the flying. Um, and uh, the Red Arrows, we have the South Korean uh, display team um, with their aircraft, which were just phenomenal, really phenomenal display team. What, uh, what do they fly? They fly, um, it's a Korean aircraft industry T-50, so it's called the Golden Hawk, okay. and it's, um, it kind of looks like a two-seat F-16, but not quite. Um, but a really, really impressive machine. Um, so they came across on a UK, t uh, sorry, a European tour. So they performed their full display at Fairford. They performed some fly pass at the Farnborough Airshoe, which is where I went to after uh, uh, Riyadh, the Royal International Air Institute. And they've also been down into Europe as well. So uh, a bit of a sales tour for that aeroplane across uh, across Europe. So I went from Royal International Air Institute, went to the Shuttleworth Collection on the Saturday. So that was the Friday, the Saturday of the Shuttleworth Collection. So vintage aeroplanes. Everything from a, you know, a, a replica 1910 Avro triplane and a Bristol box kite through to hurricanes and spitfires and things like that. That was the Saturday evening, then went straight down to Farnborough to be on site at the Farnborough show on the Sunday morning. Into London on the Sunday night <laughs> and then five consecutive days at uh, Farnborough, so the big Farnborough trade show. Left there Friday night, flew to Chicago Saturday morning to come to Oshkosh. So I think I'm going to be home on about the 3rd of August. I think I've kind of lost track. I, are your dogs going to recognize you when you get back? No, I think. The... <laughs> and, and what are you taking your wife as a gift? Well, I've bought presents for the dogs so far. <laughs> I, I guess I should take something for my wife as well. Yeah, you're right. Probably, like, probably. Thanks for the tip, Steve. <laughs> I know where the gift are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, contrast uh, Farnborough, because we've all heard about it. And very few of us on this side of the ocean have been there. But contrast that show with this one. Chalk and cheese, apples and pears. Um, it's um, Farnborough is a trade show. Uh, there is no flying display as such that you get here. There's a small flying display on the Friday, which is called the, the Pioneers of Tomorrow, which is effectively the Young Eagles type uh, promoting the future. So lots of STEM activities. But for the other four days, there's a, a trade display. So you'll see the latest Airbus A350 and Boeing took across the 73710 and the 777X. So you see big aeroplanes like that really being thrown around. You know, it's not a fly pass. They've got sort of 60 degrees of wing over, and it's really quite impressive. They're all ex-military guys that are flying these, these test pilots out. It's really impressive. 
Um, but no GA. You know, it's like the smallest aeroplane I saw there was a Cessna Caravan. I think there were a couple of the little electric pipistrels on static display. Um, but it's more of a military and commercial aviation selling fest. So um, I spent a bit of time with the Turkish aircraft industries, which was really interesting. They um, had their Herkus there, which was their turboprop trainer. So a little bit like the Texan 2, you know, the Textron Tex um, Texan 2. Um, they got some helicopters and some drone, a lot of, a lot of drones, UAVs. And then they had the mock-up of their TFX, which is their um, fifth generation stealth fighter, which they're rolling out next March. And it's um, it, it looks kind of a cross between an F-35 and an F-22, really impressive bit of kit. And I managed to get in the cockpit of that mock-up. I was the first non-Turkish journalist that uh, got the tour of the cockpit, and that was really fascinating. It's, uh, Congratulations. Looking, looking forward to seeing that. Uh, <laughs> take to the air. I think they're looking at a 2024 maiden flight with that. Yeah. So that'll be one to watch. Don't rule out the team. It, we, we think of it, the aerospace industries as being the US, right. Europe. So you've got Dassault in France, you've got British BA systems in the UK. And there's a lot of other emerging nations now, which have got some, some tech we really need to pay attention to. Good. And you just recently picked up an award. I did. Thank uh, you. And, uh, I'm uh, sort of a uh, high-tech uh, article that you had written. I did. Um, I've worked for various magazines over the years, and I was recently working for a magazine called Aircraft Cabin Management, um, which was all about the <laughs> anything in the cabin, so seats, in-flight entertainment, catering, on onboard Wi-Fi, things like that. And I wrote an article on aircraft filters, would you believe? It really was that interesting. And um, it was shortlisted for an award at the Aerospace Media Awards um, for the, um, the category was passenger and crew well-being. And I was lucky enough to win. So um, huge honor. And the award ceremony was at the Royal Aeronautical Society, which also happens to be my office. Um, so um, I, I look, you know, Facebook gives you these memories. And this time last year, this time four years ago, you were doing X, Y and Z. And um, three years ago to that day, I checked in at the Royal Aeronautical Society at another of these dinners. And I said in my acceptance speech, I can't believe three years down the line, I call this incredible place my office. You know, it used to be the Duke of Wellington's house. We've yes. got marble um, obelisks and big mahogany doors. And it's one of the, it's a privilege to, to, to walk through those doors. You know, it's a society that was formed in the 1860s. And it's just such a, I can't, I, I still pinch myself when I go into work every day. <laughs> well, congratulations on the award Thank and uh, for, uh, for being the uh, deputy editor of the, the magazine, and, and it sounds like a pretty nice office space. It's a, uh, we're in the servants' quarters upstairs, oh, okay. obviously. <laughs> that was great. Oh, good. Stephen Bridgewater is with us. Uh, any final thoughts before we kind of wrap things up tonight? I'm just really pleased to be back at Oshkosh. You know, and it, it, the, there is no other event like this. You know, you, you look out and you've got it. Well, so what can we see? F-18s, f 35 Super Chipmunk, we've got a Beach 18, we've got a field full of classic vintage aircraft. Turn around and you've got airliners and military aircraft. Nowhere else does this. This is adventure. This is Oshkosh. This is why it's my 10th visit and it won't be my last. Very good. That is going to wrap it up for our uh, Werber Tube uh, program for tonight. And uh, we have to end a little bit early so we can all get in position for the uh, night air show, which is coming up in just a few minutes. Thank you for joining us. If you would, please, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, make sure you uh, like us on Facebook and uh, subscribe on YouTube. And also make sure you click that bell button so that uh, when we go live, you get the notifications of uh, what's happening. So again, thank you, uh, Stephen, to uh, Hank Coates, president of uh, CAF, and Dick Nipinski from EIA's PR department for uh, joining us tonight. And uh, for you for putting up with uh, some camera movement and little little glitches here and there. But uh, so for our, uh, our audience, thank you for from me uh, for sticking with us. So uh, with that, we will wrap up. Uh, if you haven't been here, you got to get here. And if you are here, well, you know what we're talking about. So for the uh, CIF Warbird 2, I'm Steve Buss. Have a great night. We'll talk to you next week.